Well, I think the, the national soul is always the big story. Who we are, what we're trying to be, what our fate is, where we will stand in the moral universe when uh, these things are reckoned. That's always the big story. I'm Bill Moyers. Tonight in this final broadcast of our series, we'll hear a summing up of what some thoughtful men and women have said about the big story and our national soul. A World of Ideas with Bill Moyers. When I walk in here, I am struck by how calm and serene the library is compared to the gridlock, turmoil, and conflict of the street outside. Does the world of the stacks have much in common with the world of the street out there? Absolutely. The content of the books have everything to do with the street out there. So I became a teacher because I benefited from my teachers. You became a teacher because you had good teachers? Yes. In everybody who has gone to college, and I'm sure in your case oh, also. Absolutely. We all have been affected with one teacher. I spoke with Martha Nussbaum in New York about virtue and tragedy and why she believes we need to hear what ancient Athens has to say to modern America. You write about these ancient Greeks, Aristotle, Hecuba, Antigone, Creon, as if they were next door neighbors. I think I've lived with them for a long time and I guess I think that the, the big problems that those great works put in front of us haven't changed all that much, and that the Greek works face them head on with a, a courage and a, an eloquence that I don't always find in, in modern works on moral philosophy. E.L. Doctorow has been conducting a long meditation on the meaning of modern American history. In his novels, truth emerges from the shadows, reality and myth mingle to reveal a history once hidden. Ragtime, his best-selling novel which won the National Book Critics Circle Award and became a movie by the same name, evokes America at the beginning of the century when progress was divorced from justice. I talked with Ed Doctorow at his home in Sag Harbor, New York on the very day he completed his new novel. Do you still think as you did a couple of years ago that our, our literary life is quiet? compared to earlier periods of this century? Well, I think we tend today to be more miniaturists than we used to be. Miniaturists writing in small strokes about we've, small... Yes, we've constricted our lens. We've come in the house. What we is close the door, pull the shade, reporting on what's going on in the bedroom, the kitchen, but forgetting the street outside and the town and the highway. The big story. You yeah. once said the, the, our writers are less and less seem inclined to take on the big story. What is the big story? A World of Ideas with Bill Moyers. Here in Washington, the summer was one of the hottest on record. But Jessica Tuckman Matthews says that the phenomenon that troubled us all summer might be good for us. A good warning, that is. For most of her career, Dr. Matthews has been getting out the word to the public and to the federal government that the health of our planet is deteriorating. Formerly on the editorial board of the Washington Post, where she covered science and technology, Dr. Matthews also advised the White House on global policy during the 70s, when she served on the National Security Council. She is a scientist with a Ph.D. in biochemistry and biophysics. I took my questions to her at the World Resources Institute, where she is vice president of the group that monitors global ecology. Barbara Tuckman is one of the most widely read historians of our day. She published her first book at the age of 50. Now in her late 70s, she has won the Pulitzer Prize twice for her classic work on the opening days of World War I and for her biography of an American in China, Joseph Stilwell. Mrs. Tuckman has covered many periods and people in a lifetime of practicing history, but she's also written frequently about the social and political issues of our times. We visited her in her home in Coscob, Connecticut, where she has completed a new book called The First Salute. This time, Barbara Tuckman turns her attention to the American Revolution. It was terribly exciting. The American Revolution I mean, the, 
I don't think they thought at the beginning of establishing a new kind of government, but very soon they realized that that was what they were doing. Is there a value to reading history? Well, for one thing, it's frightfully interesting, I think. You know, when people say, what's the use of reading history? I say, well, what's the use of, of, a, a, of a Beethoven sonata? I mean, you don't have to have a use, posit a tangible use. You have to have something that makes life um, more valuable. And to me, uh, reading history does even though it only shows what is past. Coleridge, I think it was, said this wonderful line who said, history is only a lantern on the stern. It tells you where you've been. Well, that's worth knowing, where you've been. From our home in Connecticut, this has been a conversation with Barbara Tuckman. I'm Bill Moyers. Tom Wolfe dresses like a dandy from the 19th century, but his beat is the popular culture of the 20th, the follies of modern times. With the candy-colored tangerine flake Streamline Baby, his first collection of essays, Wolfe in the 1960s helped to invent a new journalism. It snapped, crackled, and popped with exclamation marks, word pictures, and dialogue that bounced and cavorted like some of the exotic characters Wolfe found growing in liberated America. Other books followed. Radical Chic, with its unforgettable portrait of piety on Park Avenue. The Right Stuff, and why America's space-age test pilots had it. For a year now, Tom Wolfe's novel, Bonfire of the Vanities, has been on the bestseller list, carrying readers into the depraved, amoral, and absurd life of New York City in the age of acquisition. Wolfe has eyes like blotters, soaking up what others look at but do not see. And like the 19th century novelists who are his literary heroes, he is first and foremost a reporter of the life around him. We talked at his townhouse on the east side of Manhattan. He says, what do you want us to do? <laughs> he says, guy, I don't know. He says, what, what were you going to do? He said, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You tell us. <laughs> I was astonished. that I read Bonfire before, before the Tawana Brawley case broke. And then it broke, and I thought, wait a minute. They set this up to confirm his book. <laughs> this, you anticipated that. I, it was right out of the book. This is an amazing, wonderful period to be a writer in. Uh, and I don't see how a writer can operate without going out as a reporter. I don't care if you're writing plays, movies, or even if you're a poet. I don't see any other way to, to do it. And yet so many writers are, at this moment, uh, turning, turning inward. I don't, I don't get it. Think of the feast. Think of the feast that's out there. From New York City, this has been a conversation with Tom Wolfe. I'm Bill Moyers. And somewhere we've come to another era in which we're going to have to look at our, our governments, our state uh, as well as and local governments is supplementing families, not pushing them to do something. Tomorrow night, in part two of our conversation, Dr. Brazelton discusses his ideas about what the country can do to back up families. From Cambridge, Massachusetts, I'm Bill Moyers. <laughs>